the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 733 for Monday, October 29th, 2018. Welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab. You know what we do here. We like car talk for Apple users. Kids, you can ask your parents what that means. I'll tell you. It means we take your questions. We take your tips. We take your cool stuff found. We mix them all together so that we can answer your questions and share the, all the cool stuff found and tips that you send in and that we find so that we can all learn at least five new things every single time we get together, which is like clockwork, basically once a week. That's how, that's how it works. Sponsors for this episode include Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com. We'll talk more about some of the cool things they have to offer you later here. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here, yet again, in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is... John F. Braun. John F. Braun, as far as you know. How you doing today, Mr. John F. Braun? Yeah, I was telling you in pre-show, you know, there are just some days you wake up and you're just kind of, eh, even with coffee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, I don't drink coffee. Help, but, but, but you made a suggestion and, and I'm going to take this uh, seriously. I'm going to, for once, listen to your advice. And uh, But you said that your morning regime includes uh, down in a couple of, couple of, glasses or more of water yeah, I, I wake up and drink two glasses of water right out of the gate i started doing it less than a month ago very difficult thing to convince my body to do but once i finish drinking the two glasses then i feel really good so i i just you know i just power through it now it's actually gotten a lot easier but the first 10 days or so were kind of a chore but yeah, yeah it's really and, good for and your you. body craves water yes. not as much as brondo right do, do you know what i'm talking about <laughs> Very nicely done. Yes, sure. Yes. yes. It, it, <laughs> uh, what is it? Idiocracy? Watch the movie. It, it's hilarious. People yeah. It's actually maybe a, a pre... A, a, no, I'm, I won't say anymore, but uh, check it out. It's cool. fun. So anyways, I've had my water. Good. I've had other beverages. I've had snacks and food. So I am on a good, good path right now. Sweet. So long. Uh, well, I am going to share something cool with you, and then it's going to get even cooler. So John Martellaro posted this as cool stuff found earlier or late, I don't know, within the last week over uh, here at Mac Observer. And it's a utility called the Time Machine Mechanic, or T2M2. And it is written, created by the folks at Eclectic Light Company. And as we know, they uh, are also the ones that make... Uh, oh, what's it called? The, 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 the terminal looking thing so that you could see what was there and why can't I remember the name of it? Consolation, the console log viewer for Sierra and high Sierra. Once things changed. Uh, yeah. Where are they? Are they on three now? Because I think they had constellation one constellation two and constellation. Uh, no, they're I at constellation 2.4, but ah. time machine mechanic it will analyze your logs and discover whether time machine backups have been running normally or reporting any like errors or info or anything. And you don't you don't need to be able to understand logs to be able to check for problems because they parse through it and then sort of translate it for you with the time machine mechanic and the time machine mechanic is free. So I was like, whoa, that's great. Like I only knew about Constellation from Eclectic Light, not anything else. And so I visited the site as we were preparing for this show. They have so many apps that I didn't know about. It's ridiculous. They've got a rich text editor, text editor called Delight Ed. They've got a thing that will allow you to check what, um, what uh, permissions you've given to an app. Like, like specifically, can it see the camera? Can it see the microphone? Can it see your contacts? It's an app called Tassy or Tacky, T-A-C-C-Y. Also there at Eclectic Light. Uh, they've got uh, some performance analysis apps and things like that. I mean, they're they're developers, but and they mainly write apps for developers, but not only. They have Keychain Check, which allows you to check your keychain for problems. 
We don't have that anymore. It was taken out back in, I think, Sierra. Uh, so really, really cool stuff. You got to go check out Eclectic Lights downloads. Uh, so this was like a cool stuff found that opened the treasure trove. So very cool stuff. Very, very cool stuff. Right? Yep. And uh, if you look in the chat room, Dave, so I was surprised and somewhat honored um, that apparently they did a little post about us mentioning Constellation 3 and our podcast. They did. Yeah, back that's in right. 2017. Yeah. So um, so they got the hint that you know, everybody wants to see a new version because who doesn't? Right. Right. <laughs> right. That's right. Yeah. You know, yeah. But no, love, love their stuff. Yeah. So, uh, as, as Alex Santos in the chat room at MacGeekab.com slash stream says, uh, they put the stuff in that Apple takes out. So, which is great. So good stuff. And with console, I don't think we're alone, Dave, in that the update to console and the new format is befuddling to many people. Yes. But with these tools, you can unbefuddle the fuddleness. <laughs> unbefuddle. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. That, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and then we heard from Evgeny, who uh, is actually the developer of Remote Control for Mac, an app that lets you use your phone to control your Mac in a very specific way. And it's been, that's been cool stuff found actually a couple of times on this show. But now uh, they've updated Remote Control for Mac and added Siri shortcuts for all system actions like restart, sleep, display off and things like that. So. If you're like me and you're having a problem with your Mojave Mac not turning off your displays, well, now you could use remote control for Mac and your phone to use a Siri shortcut to tell it to turn off your displays from, you know, even, you know, far away, like from somewhere else in the house, which is super handy. So thank you for that, Evgeny. That's uh, very, very cool stuff indeed. Right? Good, John? I'm going to burn so through far. some cool stuff found here. Yeah. Cause it's, you know, it's fun. Light it up. Yeah. So we've talked, we talked about uh, Linux and, and boot disks and all that stuff uh, in a couple of, a couple of episodes ago. And Joe recommended, um, he, he said, I know you were using just straight Ubuntu. He said, there's a, a uh, I'm trying to think of it. It's a, a, a different twist. It, it's got Ubuntu at its core, Ubuntu Linux. Um, and I had said that, you know, Ubuntu, especially with the way that gnome which is its desktop manager it's its graphical user interface we call the graphical user interface we use on our macs mac os 10 or mac os now right um the one that that uh, ubuntu linux uses by default is called gnome g-n-o-m-e that felt really comfortable to us as as mac users to my son and i as we were putting this together well there is yet another uh, graphical interface window manager whatever you want to call it available for Ubuntu Linux that looks even more Mac-like. And we messed around with this too. It's called Elementary OS and it's at elementary.io. Like when you launch the system, like the, I think it's the settings app or something, it looks just like system preferences. I mean, this, this thing feels so at home for a Mac user that it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. So uh, we'll, we'll put a link in the show notes, of course, but uh but if you've got an old Mac that maybe isn't able to run, you know, an uh, an updated, updatable version of Mac OS and you want security updates and things like that, and you still want to keep like breathe some life into that machine. Or if you've got an old Windows laptop and you don't want to run Win or a new Windows laptop, then you don't want to run Windows on it and you don't want to, you know, Hackintosh it. Uh, some flavor of Linux, and including this elementary OS, is, is a good option. So. Thank you for sending that in, Joe. Very, very cool. Cool stuff. And then, um, do you have anything to say on that one, John, before I move us along? No, I uh, I, I went to the webpage and I look at it and it looks like it's running on a Mac-like computer. It's, and uh, it looks, you know, I'm surprised the lawyers haven't been. Uh... <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think there's enough there to get, it, yeah. they're not ripping off mac os they are paying Inspired. homage to it Inspired. yeah exactly yeah and there's not enough money there for apple's lawyers to to try and go after it so they 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 need to go after the you know chinese knockoff iphones i think is more more important to them mm -hmm. uh 
The uh, Eric sends in uh, cool stuff found. He says, I believe that every owner of Apple products should listen to the Mac Observer's Daily Observations podcast of October 25th, 2018, starting at the 18 minute mark concerning Apple repairs, the Genius Bar and the Apple Repair Depot. He says, I can't remember the guy's name, but the info is great. And and Eric's right. Jeff Gamut had me as a guest on on Daily Observations last week. And we talked about a lot of the things that you can and should do when you have Apple repairs. I, I, I encourage you to listen so that we don't have to rehash the same 10 minutes here. But the uh, the TLDR of that is if you have something that can be repaired in house at the Genius Bar, then the Genius Bar, Genius Bar can be a good option. If it needs to be sent off, the Genius Bars continue to prove that they do not manage things well when they are sent out of the shop and because the genius bar controls those repairs you're actually left with less options as opposed to more if it needs to be sent off to the apple's depot you're better off setting up the repair yourself either online or in the apple support app on your you know on your iphone or ipad and then shipping it to apple yourself as opposed to bringing it to the genius bar and letting them sort of own the process you're much better off so we will put a link to all that in the show notes, but uh, but thanks, Eric, for reminding me that we should tell everybody here about that, too, because it is it is important. Things keep changing with the way to deal with support, and that's that's definitely the way to go. So thoughts about that, John? OK, um, my only reflection is that when I did have and it was a, I think it was a 12 inch. How long ago was Max- this? Uh, uh, many years ago. Okay. So things, as you things pointed are, out, have changed. Things have changed remember, dramatically. Yeah. It was, uh, I think I had to send the machine between me and Apple like six times. And eventually I got to someone, I guess it was in uh, customer relations. Sure. Um, not customer support. And I'm like, guys, you're, you're losing everything on this support contract by just the shipping, even if you're paying almost nothing. We've done it six times. It's like, can I get a new machine? And they're like, yeah. Yeah. No. And that's the other piece of it. We talked about that in the, in the TDO episode that when it, when the repair process does not lead to satisfactory results, uh, then there are the customer service ninjas at Apple customer relations that. And they're authorized. And even this guy said, you know, we're going to give you a machine of the vintage uh, if you had bought it now in in the product line. And I'm like, cool. Yeah. Everybody was happy. Yeah. No, they, they, they're good. They're good. So cool. And I'm with you. Once it gets out of their control, every repair that I've had done at an Apple store, and it's almost exclusively been on my phone and not my computer, as long as it was handled in store, um, results were always, uh, beyond my expectations yes so. in store correct but if they have to ship it out take it back send it off yourself you're better off so uh and uh alex santos in the chat room is saying and remember in in some cases apple will come pick it up especially desktops he says it's called on-site service and it's in your apple care contract uh, on-site repair for desktop computers request that a technician come to your work site so there really? you go yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So remember that. Uh for sure. Wow, that's great. Cool. He says uh they don't repair it on site. They come pick it up and return it for free. So, hey. That there's another reason to get Apple Care right there. So Speaking of me speaking, uh I am speaking now, but also uh, in uh, about a week and a half uh, at Mac Tech Conference, Thursday, the five, six, seven, eighth, um, I am speaking at Mac Tech about uh, Wi-Fi. We'll get into the some of the geekier details of Wi-Fi and mesh and oh, how to. What do is all Mac that Tech, stuff. Dave? I have never heard of such a show. Well, Mac Tech is a conference. Enough. Yeah, yeah, no, no I'm, thank you for prompting me. Yeah, um, Mac Tech is a conference that happens out in L.A. every year. It's a, it's. It's meant for, uh, you know, the geekier amongst us, the IT pros, uh, some enterprise. Uh, there's an enterprise c- contingent of the audience that shows up. It's usually about 250 or 300 people. It's a really good group of people. A lot of consultants there. 
uh, which is frankly why they're bringing me in because they know we have a lot of consultants in our audience here and, um, and they're kind of hoping that, uh, that more consultants will show up at, at Mac tech. I will say it is a very, very good place for consultants to learn and network. You know, we're, and, and I, I say we, because I certainly, I mean, I've done a lot of consulting. Uh, it has been my full-time gig at times and I still do uh, some of it now. So I say, we, you know, it's very easy to think that you're alone and that you have to do it all yourself and you get used to doing it all yourself. And there are other people doing the same thing as you. And it's good to sort of mind meld with them and have people that you can call and all that stuff. So, so yeah, uh, you know, it, it come to this show. It's awesome. And we've got some links with some savings and stuff. So I, I think I put that, I think I put the right thing in the show notes, my, I know a speaker link. So go check that out. Come see it. It we're all, we all hang out together. They make it like camp and Neil Tickton organizes a great conference. So in addition to all this great content, they feed you pretty much round, round the clock. Uh, and, uh, and Neil hate me for saying that, but it's not entirely false. They, they really do a good job at that. And then they also plan evening activities. So we all just sort of hang out together and there is no class system there. Uh, everybody's equal. And so we all just get to hang and have lunch and dinner together and all of that stuff. So it's, it's done the way I think a conference should be done and where everybody's just equal and they don't segregate speakers separate. You know, we're, we're all just humans and we're all interested in the same things. It's like this, you know, let's just talk. It's good. It's great. So come. Uh, it will be fun. It's out in LA uh, where it's at uh, or Redondo beach, cool. which is part of LA. Okay. Yeah, so. so I searched. So it looks like 2010 is when they started doing their event series, what okay. they call. And I guess this is one of them. Yeah. So um, maybe something to compliment or well now replace some of the things that we miss now, Dave, like Mac world and yeah, Mac kind IT. of uh, less for the end user and more for the people that help the end user. Is, is so th this is this would have been sort of the pro this this replaces the pro portion of of Macworld Expo but not the it's it's yeah it's so or yeah. Mac IT which was their kind of yes IT it replaces program. Mac IT in that in that sense yeah yeah I'm sure Neil is screaming listening to this saying, it well fills, it's not it fills exactly the space. That. it fills the space it totally does yep yep uh my uh I, another cool stuff or a quick tip actually. Uh, now that we're migrating into those here, my son was doing something. He had to log in uh, on that Windows machine to something, of course. So no iCloud keychain between his phone and, and the machine. But he knew he had the password for whatever he was logging into on his phone. And so he invoked Siri and said, what's my password for the Mac Observer? Right. Or, you know, whatever. Uh, and. The, you know, with Siri then uses, you know, touch ID to authenticate you and boom, displays your password right there on the uh, on the screen so that you can then type it into wherever you need to be much faster than tapping 16 times to get through the, all the password prompts and searching and typing and all of that stuff. You just ask, what's my password for? And say the name of the website. And you can say the URL or you can even get, you know, creative and or not creative, but you can be more casual about it. And and it like I tested it with quite a few things and it just works. I was like, yeah, I was like, well, uh, you know, what's my password for TiVo? And boom, it showed me my password to log into TiVo. It's pretty good. I like it. You think? I, I think it's great. Yeah, it's way faster than. Well, what if what 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 if like, you know, I broke into your house and like took your your device and you can't unlock my phone. Why not? Oh, face ID. Right. Well, or my passcode. I mean, you'd need to have my face or my passcode or, you know, if you don't have face ID, you have touch ID. So, I mean, it's but the same. You just happen to carelessly leave your device unlocked and I ask it for the password. Then I get it, right? No, it's still going to ask you to uh, to authenticate because it's a password. With right? a pa oh, okay. okay. It's just like if you navigated through settings to to get to the passwords. I mean, it's it's not showing you anything you couldn't already get on your phone if you were able to unlock oh, it. Okay. Right, you go to settings, passwords and accounts, uh, website and app passwords. Of course, you have to authenticate there, and then you can search that list. But that's a list with potentially, you know, hundreds or thousands of things in it. It's way easier to okay. tell it what you want. Yeah, no, no, no. This is great. Yeah, yeah, it's good. I like it. I mean, I like the proximity thing, which uh, 
not this weekend when I hung up with the family, but I think another weekend I brought my phone near another one of my devices and it's like, Hey, you want to, you want to use the password from this device? And I'm oh, like, yeah. well, gee, that's kind of a smart thing to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just like, I think this is what you want to do because you're bringing me next to something else that you have. Yeah. No, yeah, that, that cool. actually shocked me the first time it happened. I was like, what? No, it's it, they're doing good stuff. And I think this asking Siri for your password is a new thing in iOS 12. So if you can't have iOS 12. Never tried it. I'm with yeah. you. I know. I, I had forgotten about it until I heard my son do it from across the room. And it was like, oh, that's right. I'm putting it on the list, man. So very cool. Keith has a quick tip for us. Keith says, uh, when I've got my MacBook connected to the charger, but with the lid closed, uh, so kind of a throwback to what we were talking about last week, he says, sometimes I get the annoying chime sound, which I can only assume is when the battery drops a tiny bit, and so it effectively resumes the charging process again. It's the same notification sound I get when I plug the charger in. He says, but it annoys me when my computer is sleeping. He says, I've been able to turn it off using the following terminal command, which is, and I'm just going to read it quickly and we'll put it in the show notes. Defaults write com.apple.powerchime, chime on no hardware dash bool true, uh, which essentially says you turn on the chime on no hardware thing. So very, very cool. And we will, as promised, put that in the show notes. So it's, it's there. I promise it will be there. So Ooh. thanks for that, Keith. Thanks for that. That's really cool. Yeah. I haven't seen it for a while. Bool, of course, stands for Boolean, which basically means it's something that can have one of two values. Right. Right. On or off. Or one. Yes or no, true or false. Pretty cool, Keith. Thank you for for sharing that. And, you know, while we're on the subject, we, um, we, over the years, we have really paid attention to how batteries, uh, how Macs deal with their batteries, specifically... Is it bad to leave your Mac plugged in all the time? And it it previously was uh, not uh, not because of the the type of battery, but because of the way your Mac managed the type of battery. Um, it for a, for a long time, even with lithium ion batteries, it just didn't work out well. If you left your Mac plugged in all the time, the the battery would essentially lose it, the ability to charge and so you'd wind up with this battery that just ran down very very quickly and you know we always used to say the best thing for your battery and this is still true is to keep the electrons flowing so either keep them flowing out of the battery because you're using it on you know on battery and not on charge or plugged in charging back up but once it's at 100 bad you know to 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 run it and that is still true But what seems to have changed is the way Apple's software and firmware manage this stuff. And they seem to do a much better job of keeping the electrons flowing even when your Mac is plugged into power. So it lets it drain down and then it charges it back up, as evidenced by what Keith is hearing here. And as it turns out, you know, we we did a thing. I think it was in our old Facebook group um, where we had a lot of different people chime in about this and, and shared you know, their experiences with this. And so it was just a lot of anecdotal evidence, but it certainly all seems to point to anything from about a 2014 Mac or newer seems to do really well, no matter what, like if you leave it plugged in all the time, uh, your, your battery, you know, your full battery charge capacity won't dwindle precipitously. And uh, it's kind of like, it's just not a thing you need to worry about anymore, which is really great. I'm I'm stoked about this. So, why are you? Why are you? This is a good because thing, John. I have a 2012 MacBook Pro. Right. Now, the thing is, I use something, and I still think it's something that people should look at. But it's called fruit juice. Mm. Well, fruit a- juice was created out of the conversation in this show, whatever, eight years ago when we were discussing all this stuff because we needed something to remind us that our Macs needed to not stay plugged in all the time, but, it, and so it's good. If you have an older Mac, maybe it's still good to run it, but uh, anything, you know, the last four or five years, you don't have to worry about it. Yep. And yep. we know the fruit juice guy. He's, yeah. he's to- totally cool. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. We did lunch, but, um, uh, what else? Hmm. 
Anything right. else? It'll to come add back to, to me. Okay. But anyways, no, because I got the 2012, and the thing is, of course, my 2014 Mac Mini is on uh, uh, AC power. Right. So, uh, of course. Of course. But uh, Fruit Juice says for older Macs, there's a great job of helping you manage the whole charging. It does a great job. Drum. It remind it reminds you to put your battery on charge, take your battery off charge. It, it does a really fine job with it. So if you are running an, um, a Mac that's more than about four or five years old, I highly recommend for juice still. Yeah. Oh, for sure. yes. So here's the other thing. So I noticed this too. So Dave, so we got some of these handouts and I was frustrated because I, I couldn't um, uh, find a website that worked for it. So it was a handout from Newegg. You got one that you really liked this battery pack. And I got one that was a cable that had little LEDs in it showing if it was charging or not. And I noticed this, Dave, at least with my iOS devices, is once they were done, the lights turned off. Yep. So I think per what you were saying, the, the iOS and macOS have done a much better job of saying, hey, look, I'm done, All right? Stop. Well, <laughs> no, no, that that always that happened. I saw this. That, well, I mean, I it always this. stopped when when you got to the top like that, that, of course, the device stops drawing power when it doesn't need any more. The trick is that it essentially doesn't just stop charging, but it stops even trickle charging it. It lets it drain a whole lot more than right. it used to and then brings it back up. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. Cool. But it was cool at one point when I saw this cable and I came downstairs and I'm like, Oh my gosh, the light's not on. Stop. Why? Yeah. I'm like, well, because it's fully charged. It doesn't need. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, quick tip in the forums. Uh, and I will put a link to the forums. Of course, uh, Feek actually, Feek is, is his name in the forums. Uh, actually asked and then answered his own question. He says in iOS 11, it was possible to search for nearby photographs. I can't find that in iOS 12. Has it gone away or is it just hidden somewhere? And he says, uh, turns out it was just hidden. Open a photograph, then swipe up and places is the first thing shown along with show nearby photos. He says, does this count as a cool stuff found? I think it counts as a quick tip. So here we are. Yeah. Thanks, Peek. Good stuff. I like it. It's weird. They put, I had to, I had to, it took me a long time to learn to swipe up with the music app uh, to get at like the shuffle features and all of that stuff that was just, you know, exposed in whatever it was, iOS 10, I guess. And then iOS 11 was when that changed, but it seems like a similar thing in photos. When you see the photo, just swipe up. There's more below. Keep going. So kind of like when you, uh, you know, hold down the option key on your Mac, right. To, to see the extra stuff in iOS. Yeah, even though it looks like it's it's all just one page. Swipe up. There might be something hidden below. So thanks, Feek. Good. Yeah. So another unexpected thing. Yes. So I had this happen today with photos. Uh, we're kind of talking about photos here. But all of a sudden, on one of my devices, I think it was my iPhone, it's like, hey, here's some memories. Beach Days 2012. And then it showed a picture of my friend, uh, and I, I believe you met her too, uh, uh, Melissa, the Mac Mommy. Yeah. Because she came out to visit me one time in Connecticut. And uh, and so uh, Photos decided to put together a nice little video montage. <laughs> well, at least one of them with, with her in there. And I actually sent it to her. I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know. Uh... It just came up. And I'm like, why are you doing this? It's like, well, you know, it, actually looking back, it's like, wow, that's actually not a bad video. It put the music in there and, you know, the pictures that were you know, important to me and stuff. And uh, it was actually a nice uh, beachside, uh, and it called the beach days. It knew it was like, yeah. well, these are beach photos. Yeah. It's like the beach, but it's uh, pretty good. That's it's awesome. neat when these things pop up. Yeah. Cause uh, as far as I know, it didn't cost me anything. It just kind of did it on its own. It's like, well, you got a lot of beach photos and uh, here we go. It does a nice job, it, you know, and it's, it's actually worth, Checking out what like uh, Google Photos would will do and Amazon. I, I don't see quite as much of that stuff from Amazon's photos, but I get notifications from Google Photos all the time saying, "Hey, we've created you know a similar thing for your check out." Amazon this day. just did that. I didn't publish it, but it was like, "Oh, you and Dave have been friends for so long. Here's a nice video of all the times you've been together." And I'm like, "Yeah." Amazon did this, or Facebook did? 
Or no, Facebook. I'm sorry. Okay. Facebook. All right. Yeah, no, because Amazon, you know, you can upload your photos to them and and just like you can with iCloud and, and Google and all that stuff. No, Facebook was like, hey, you yeah. and Dave have been friends for this amount of time and and you've tagged each other. So uh, here's a, here's a, you know, nice. a crowd video. But, uh, <laughs> I decided, well, maybe I'll share it with you or others. Oh, yeah. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Graham McKay in the forums has, it, it was a related discussion going on, but he reminded me of something that I had forgotten about. And that's what a quick tip that that's like the definition of how to recognize that something should be a quick tip. And he says, uh, he was talking about, it was a Bluetooth related thing. And he says, remember uh, that you can do a reset of the Bluetooth module on the Mac. You option shift click on the Bluetooth icon in the menu bar. So you need to have that exposed first, uh, which is done in system preferences, Bluetooth. Then again, option shift click on the Bluetooth icon and choose from the debug menu, reset the Bluetooth module. Uh, so somebody was having trouble with connecting a Bluetooth keyboard. I think they were running a beta version of Mojave. So it, that might well be the issue, but the reminder of Resetting the Bluetooth module when you're having general Bluetooth maladies is a great one. And I totally forgot. It. I mean, it's been years since I've thought of that. So option shift and click on the menu bar icon. So that's like one step beyond option, which is great. So thank you, Graham. Very, very cool stuff. Right. Good. No. Why it's is terrible. That Why is that bad? Why should you have to reset the Bluetooth module? That, that That's Things, ludicrous. Dude. If, if it makes well, me I, shake me, my fist, well, I, I appreciate that. But let me point out that if things <laughs> if everything worked exactly as it was supposed to, either we wouldn't have this show or it would be mm -hmm. remarkably different from what we actually do here currently, because, you know, no. Right. <laughs> so there you go. No, of course, yeah. I'm with you yeah, now. Yeah. For those that are asking, hey, I don't see a Bluetooth icon in my menu bar. Well, what you need to do is you need to go to system preferences. And then there's a Bluetooth icon, and there's a little checkbox, show Bluetooth in menu bar. That's how you get that menu. Normally, I don't believe it's shown by default. So that's how you get it. I think it, I think it is on by default. I can't remember, to be perfectly honest. You know, honest. I, I, I seem to recall a discussion. Oh, no, no. This was an iOS discussion. So yeah. in iOS 12, yeah. they actually do not sh intentionally showed the Bluetooth module because the discussion that I saw was that Apple felt, why do you need to know this? And why are we taking up space in your precious, especially uh, yeah, on, uh, smaller phone, iPhone yeah. screen? Yeah. Why are we taking space with this icon? And the thing is, they intentionally in iOS 12 removed it. Sorry, guys. The thing is, I, uh, I, I actually agree with that decision, Dave. Oh, it's like, totally. do, I need, do I need to know that Bluetooth is communicating with something on my iPhone. And the thing is, I don't. Well, and I think the other problem with that was people were seeing that and thinking, oh, this is, you know, dramatically negatively impacting my battery life. I'm going to turn it off. And then winding up with problems <sighs> where like your watch doesn't work or, you know, on the iPad, your Apple Pencil doesn't work. There's so many things that Bluetooth is used for. Your car, your AirPods, right? The continuity with your Mac. Like so many different things that Apple for a while now has been working hard to make it so that you can't actually turn off Bluetooth. Right. Without really knowing that you want to, you know. And, and right. the thing is now yeah, also, good. it's called Bluetooth LE, low energy. The well, some of it is, is yeah. It's... Well, but yeah, if properly implemented, Bluetooth shouldn't be like a major drain on your battery because the, the intent is the radios and, and all this stuff and, and the protocols will make sure that it's not doing yeah. stupid stuff. That's right. No, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Speaking of Bluetooth, we have a question. So why don't we we'll we'll blend things together. We'll go from quick tips to follow up questions from uh, 732. And this one's related to Bluetooth. So uh, Stevie says, I recently had the exact same symptoms on my MacBook that you gentlemen discussed in the lap last episode. I had my MacBook asleep in its sleeve and the following morning found its battery completely dead and very warm to the touch. I found the reason for this behavior was the brand new Anchor wireless keyboard I just started using was still on. 
Even though after 30 seconds of no use, this keyboard claims it turns off, there's still some way in which it signals my MacBook with Mojave to believe that it's awake. It's an easy fix with the flick of a small switch and things are now back to normal. He says, uh, I love the podcast. Well, we love you too, Steve. So thank you. Uh, so th this is, I mean, this is one of the <laughs> funny that I said what I said uh, moments ago. This is one of those things. It shouldn't work that way, but obviously it does. And so you need to find a workaround. And you did. You found a workaround. Uh, but I'm I'm not I don't like this workaround because it means you have to remember to turn off your keyboard in order for your Mac not to, you know, burn itself up uh, to smithereens there. So uh, I'm wondering if better would be to use something that you can automate like keyboard maestro and have that do a sleep action where it turns off Bluetooth just as you're putting your Mac to sleep and then a wake action where it turns Bluetooth back on when you're waking your Mac back up. Right. I'm pretty sure that's doable all within keyboard maestro. And then you wouldn't have to think about whether your anchor keyboard was turned on or off because your max Bluetooth will not be listening if you turn it off. Yeah. I like it. You don't like it. No, I don't No, And I'm going to give you a better solution. Okay. okay. Even better. This is what I love. About Are you ready? Show. Yeah. All right. So, Hey, system preferences, Bluetooth, you click on that. There's an advanced button. Guess what? There are three checkboxes here in the Dave, the checkbox I don't like, so all of them are checked on my computer, which I will assume is the default behavior because I never go to Bluetooth. And there's a checkbox at the bottom that says, allow Bluetooth devices to wake this computer. Uh -huh. How about you turn that off? I don't know why that's on. Oh, I do. Because but, but to me, to me, having your Bluetooth keyboard on with your computer in your computer bag is a case where you don't want this option checked. I, I, but I yes. can understand why you would want it on. Uh, and, yeah, and on a desktop pretty, machine, you definitely want it on. Because if you have a Bluetooth keyboard, you want to be able to sit down, hit the space bar and have it wake up or a Bluetooth mouse. You're right. You know, so it sure, makes sure. sense that you'd want that. But for a desktop. Yeah. But not for not necessarily for a laptop that you expect when you close the lid, it's going to go to sleep because yeah. then all of a sudden it's like, oh, there's a Bluetooth keyboard in the bag with me. Let me wake up. And it's like, no. So. Just to let people know, there are subtle nuances I in like the it. advanced button on the Bluetooth and um, set them as you believe they should be set. As, as like Kiwi said, Graham turn points off that, Turn off that last one. I as think. Kiwi uh, Graham points Bluetooth. out in the chat room, you would want that enabled for clamshell mode because otherwise you won't be able to wake your Mac up. Right. But like uh, right. I said, yeah. for a I'm bringing my computer home in my computer bag along with the keyboard, you don't want your computer to wake up. Yep. Because. <laughs> yep. But it, it's interesting that they have these three subtle nuances of Bluetooth behavior um, in the advanced button. So, hey, everybody, when you see an advanced button, check it out. Yeah. Now, can we option click that advanced button and get more? No. OK. I just had to check. So it's good to check. It's good to check. It's good to check. Always good to check. You know what else is good, John, is our first sponsor, which is Otherworld Computing at MacSales.com. They've got their new Thunderbolt 3 10 gig Ethernet adapter available now. This plugs right into the Thunderbolt 3 port on your Thunderbolt 3 equipped Mac and will allow you to connect to 10G Ethernet networks. No problem whatsoever. Very, very cool stuff. And of course... It's not just 10G Ethernet that it supports. It supports 10G, 5G, 2.5G, regular, regular gigabit Ethernet, and also 100 megabit Ethernet uh, as well. Plugs right in. You don't need a driver for your Mac. Um, it just plugs in and works. If you want to use it with a Windows machine, Windows 10 does require a driver, but install that like you would normally do, and all you're good to go. Uh, they, it's it's actually built to be really rugged. You should take a look at this thing. I'll, I'll put a link to it in the sponsored portion of the show notes here, so you can see it. This thing looks like it's a it's a serious little uh, piece of gear. I like it. It's well well built. And you know what? That's not a surprise because that's what OWC does, right? They build things that are reliable and useful, and they understand how they work. They understand how the Mac works. They've been doing this Mac thing longer than 
Mac Observer has been in existence and Mac Observer will hit 20 years this December, right? So OWC really knows this market. They are part of this market and they know what we want. Like on this thing, they have link lights on the on the Ethernet jack so that you know what you're getting and you know whether you're getting a 10G connection, a 5G connection or a regular gigabit connection just from the lights that you're looking at when you plug in your cable. So really cool stuff. You got to check this out. Go to Otherworld Computing at MacSales.com. That's where we go when it's time to add something to our Macs, external drives, external, you know, gigabit adapters, whatever you need. They've got it and they have good stuff. So check it out. And our thanks to Otherworld Computing at MacSales.com for sponsoring this episode. It's cool stuff. All right. What do we have next? Well, we were talking about show 732, John. So let's stick with the follow-ups on that. Carlos has uh, something for us here. And Carlos says, it's this is a tip. Now, in the last episode, we were talking about spoofed caller ID, right, John? Where uh, we had a listener who, and I can't remember your name. I'm sorry. Uh, who was having an issue where... Uh, calls were coming in that were spoofed to look like, like you had John that to look like your phone number, right. Or something similar to your digits would be enough to trick you into. And I just got one today. It, it was a, a Visa and MasterCard saying, Hey, you know what? Because you've been such a good credit citizen, we're going to give you 0% financing. You just have to give us your credit card numbers. And I'm like, sure. So spam no. calls that look like they might be someone, you know, and it, this is called spoofed caller ID, right? Uh, and we didn't come up with a way to solve this problem of not having them ring. Uh, and, you know, we talked through a couple of options, but nothing was perfect. Well, we have a couple of other options from you folks. And Carlos says, I've tried several tools over the years to do this. And the one that stands out in its ability to block those calls, which use spoofed caller ID, is called Wide Protect Spam Call Blocker. Uh, and it costs two ninety nine in the app store. It says it has the unique ability to block phone numbers based on what digits the phone number begins with. For example, if your phone number was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, oh, you could tell the app to block all incoming calls with the caller ID of one, two, three, four, five, six, X, 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 X. Right. And he says, uh, I've now found it necessary to specify the first five digits of my own phone number for the reasons we just discussed. And uh, he says the app has the ability to block up to 40 million phone numbers. In other words, up to four entire U.S. area codes if you want it. And you can also whitelist all your contacts just in case their phone number happens to collide with the blocked block that you've chosen. He says, I found Wide Protect to be an absolutely invaluable app. And after installing it, I haven't had a single spoofed caller ID ring my phone yet. So... Uh, you've got, uh, you got to check this out, John. It seems like you're, you are sus, you are subject to this, not suspect of it. I don't think you're suspect of it, but, uh, but yeah, check I it just, out. I just ignore them. I'm like, look, I don't know anybody in it. it the sure. thing is if I knew you and you had the first six digits, you would come up as somebody in my contacts list because sure. you don't, I'm going to ignore you. And every now and then I'll pick it. Like I told you today, I picked it up and they were like, blah, blah, blah. Congratulations. Oh, and by the way, press three to not. And, and I press three and nothing happened. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're just fishing for credit card numbers. Of course. Um, they, they, of course. It's pretty obvious. Yeah. Well, Albert came up with another way to solve that problem. <laughs> He says, check out G ringtones available on the app store for two ninety nine. The interface is a bit low tech, but it does the job. It allows iOS to set ringtones by contact group. So this was something we were looking to do in the last episode and couldn't find a way to do it. Well, looks like somebody built an app that can do it because apps can manipulate your contacts. He says, I have business, family, in-laws, etc. in my contacts as groups. I set the default ringtone to silence. Family to one ringtone, other groups to different ringtones. So if a call comes in that isn't in my contacts, it doesn't ring or even vibrate. But if a call comes in from family, I get a ringtone. Easy peasy. Thank you so much, Albert. That's great. And Carlos, too. These are good solutions. So we are we are good to go. I like it, man. It's good. Anything on that before we move on to Gary's tip from 732? Which, which actually... 
sort of hate these people. Why? Why they they helped us. Oh, those people. No, no. no those people. Well, then you got to get one of these apps, man. Why get they wide. Keep calling me. Get wide protect. Spend the two ninety nine. You're good to go. Or one ninety nine. When I, I get a call, was. I want it to be somebody that wants to talk to me and not. not well, they want to talk to you. Steal from me. Well, and yeah. not steal yeah. from me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Where's Gary here? Let me find Gary's. Or tell me that I'm a good person. Could you at least start with that? You know? Yeah, right. I'll do that. Right. Okay. John, you're a good person. We're going to talk about Gary. Um, <laughs> can I give him my credit card now? You can. Yeah. Give me your credit card quick. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Gary says, I just got done listening to Mac Geek 732. And you were talking about the difference in heat between using the lightning cable versus Qi wireless charging pads. I think the amount of heat also depends on the charger you're using. He says, I personally recommend the Anchor PowerWave 7.5 watt Qi wireless charger because it has a cooling fan in the base of the charger. And although it has a blue LED, which Dave doesn't like, uh, he says uh, the, he says the ring is the blue LED is pretty uh pretty out of the way, says, but it comes with the cable and the quick charge 3.0 wall wart. I have it in my bedroom. And although I don't have a nightstand next to my bed, I can tell you that I can't really see the led ring and the cooling fan is very quiet. I can't hear it unless I'm right on top of it. This is uh, you can get it on Amazon for a little under 40 bucks. So that's what a great idea. Like, why didn't we think of this last week when we were worried about heat and charging? Well, a fan, duh, pretty smart. Well, uh I want to go in a bit. Of, I think there's a difference between heat, heat due to power used to charge the battery, and heat in other parts of the system. You see where I'm okay. going with this? E- kind and of. I think I think the heat is most damaging when you're doing a fast charge or a high current or high power charge. Sure. On a battery, though, heat other in other places is when. It's coupled with battery technology is always bad. Okay. Mm-hmm. If you can go with me on that. Yeah, so yeah, heat kills. For sure. Heat kills for a lot of things, but also batteries. So the hotter the battery gets, the shorter the life. I I, I don't think that's debatable. I think that's just Yeah, I'm with you on that. Technology sure. works. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But but having less heat in other parts of the system, I, I agree with. Uh, so, so, so I guess I, I agree with both points, right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, very cool. But no, I saw a thing. And actually, no, I responded to someone in in one of our email trails here. So actually, uh, 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 one of these guys, Rene uh, Rich, uh, you know this guy? Rene Ritchie, who publishes yeah, iMore? No, of course. I actually yeah. saw one of his tweets recently, and he said, the best strategy for batteries is pretty much slow and steady wins the race. Is that if you charge at low current and low power, that's going to be something that's probably going to make your battery last the longest. And I think he's also written articles about that as well. So that's, that's my commentary on that. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's good. All right. Uh, So there we are. There we are. Do you want to take us to Keith, John? Keith has a fascinating problem and I'm just amazed that I was able to dig into the archives and figure it out. Cool. uh, It it sounds like we figured it out. So cool. And and the the source of blame is something that we've always blamed for problems on our computers. But I'm I'm going to hold you in suspense for a moment here. You so like anyways. to do that, yes. <laughs> so Keith says, "Hi, Dave and John. I've been listening for years and have just signed up for premium. Thank you so much, Keith. I wonder if you have any suggestions for me. I have an early 2016 MacBook MacBook with Mojave. Today, I noticed that some of the icons in my dock had been replaced by generic icons." This has never happened before. I killed both the finder and the dock using kill all from the terminal with no effect. By the way, if you go to the terminal and you type kill all, it will relaunch the dock uh, application, which sometimes may if you got problems with your dock. Try that. It's good stuff. Um, but he said, I rebooted. And it was still the same. I've run the current version of Onyx, gone through the maintenance option and rebooted. It's still the same. If I click on the Applications folder in my dock and I scroll up and down, you can see that some of the apps have missing icons. I'm going to assume he means generic icons. However, if I open the Application folder in the Finder, the icons are all correct. Okay, I'm wrong. (laughs) 
Oh, no, I'm yeah, generic like, icons in the, in the in the dock, right? Is is where he's right, seeing them. Yeah. But not in the application folder. Okay, right. so there's a there's a icon there's a disconnect there. Disparity yeah. Disparity here. Yeah. Hmm. So he says, I removed the mail icon from my dock, and when I try and drag it back in, when I cross the finder border, the icon goes bad. And you don't want your icons going bad, people. It's just it's not <laughs> no when icons go bad things are uh, you know they just they really go south they you know they stop talking to their families they they turn to a life of crime it's just it's not good it's not good uh, brilliant <laughs> a picture can speak a thousand words all right so he sent us a movie of this and uh, it, I, I didn't really need it um but thank you the more you can send us, whether it be a screenshot or a movie or whatever, of disturbing behavior on your computer, Dave, you should probably send it, if not an email, but at least a, a, a movie, if you want, or screenshots. You should probably send that to feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Well, I think feedback at MacGeekGab.com is a better place. And I think to wrap this up before we continue with the question here, um, feedback at MacGeekGap.com, I think, is probably the best choice. Well, Matt, you know, options. unless you're Keith or you're like Keith, because Keith is a Ooh, premium oh subscriber God. now. And so Keith gets to use premium at MacGeekGap.com. But continue, my friend. Right. And that's how we got this. So, so, so anyways, he did something with the mail, mail icon. He put it in there. We got the video, and I think uh, actually that pretty much wraps it up, Dave. Okay. So the thing is, he ran Onyx. Okay, good, good strategy because Onyx, like he said, the maintenance portion of it has options to clear out a lot of caches and and, and other things that. And if you haven't ter- haven't heard us talk about caches, Dave, um, a cache is. I can either ask for some data or can ask for an older version of data that I assume is valid. Here's the problem with cache data. Cache data can go bad. And if it goes bad, something like this is going to happen. So my suggestion to Keith was he may have a corrupt icon cache. What's an icon cache, you're asking me? Are you asking me that, Dave? Uh, What's an icon cache? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, it's a cache that stores images of icons. And you know what? If that cache gets screwed up, you're going to see generic icons in your doc or in your finder or maybe both. So I whipped out the Google Foo, Dave. Okay. And I found a dandy article over at GitHub. And it's called Clear the Icon Cache on a Mac when you start seeing generic icons in the finder or the doc. What do you think? Does that sound pretty close? I to like what we're that. Going to get that to here? <laughs> I would go with that. Yeah, man. So basically, this article goes into you have to dive into the terminal. Don't fear the terminal. It's not bad. It's not. But the it basically Reaper. digs into some kind of obscure. Um, well, one's not so obscure, Dave, and that it actually is. If you go to system, I think library caches. There's a caches directory in there, Dave, and it actually had me thinking about caches. Why not just delete all your cache directories every now and then? Because you got to admit, dude, um, a lot of the problems that we've had are due to faulty caches. Now, sometimes, um, and also he mentioned that he uh, he did a um, um, safe boot. Safe boot clears out some caches, I think mostly font caches, but not icon caches. But it was good that he tried that as well. But the thing is, there is a caches, there are explicit cache directories in your library folders. I'm just wondering if it'd be a good thing to just like write a script to like purge those. Well, like isn't isn't that what every... Onyx does? Well, that that's the thing, Dave. And then in this case, Onyx did not explicitly oh, yeah, clear out fair. this cache. It clears out many caches, but I I looked in detail in the maintenance portion of Onyx, and maybe yeah. they haven't added it yet. They could. But there is not an option to clear out the icon cache. Okay. There, there is an option to clear out lots of the others. And I mean, I love Onyx because sure. it, it lets you dig into so many things here. So maybe they just are not aware of this option or they haven't added it yet. And I hope they do. Yeah. Hi, Onyx. 
Well, we'll send them a note because we talked about them, right? So <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. Maybe they'll put that in there because I mean it it it's theoretically possible. I mean, it's just a directory in your library folder called caches, right? Yeah, that's true. That's right. Yes. And the report we got back from Keith is that fixed it. So nice. Thank you for thank you for signing up, Keith. And and we're glad that we solved your problem. Yeah, that's great, man. Yeah, I'm surprised Onyx doesn't. I I would have sworn that I I I didn't see it. No, I believe you. Yeah. 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 Now, maybe they just didn't have the data when the, uh, because the thing is Onyx, Onyx is very specific to each version of Mac OS and maybe they just haven't gotten around to, I mean, I don't think anything has changed about the cache directory within the library folder, but maybe it has, I don't know. Or they just, or they just haven't added it. So yeah. Onyx guys, maybe you should add this. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that would be good. Yep, I agree. All right, cool. Uh, I got a couple more from the forums, John, because it's uh, it's where I've been spending some time there, and I, lots of you have too, uh, including uh, Soccer Dad, who asks, and it was answered. Uh, he says, "Hello, fellow geek gabbers. In Windows, in the display settings, you can select for one of only." You know, uh, for only one of two or more connected monitors to display anything, Uh, it says all content is then displayed on that monitor. Regardless, when you need the extra space of two monitors, you can then go back and select to extend to get both monitors to be active. So uh, the idea is he wants to be able to do this on his Mac. And it's like disconnecting your second external display, but instead of physically disconnecting it, Windows allows you to, uh, you know, uh, effectively virtually disconnect it. Uh, He says, I would love to be able to do this on my Mac. And Alex Santos came to the rescue with uh, a thing he found on GitHub, believe it or not, called Disable Monitor. And it sits up in the menu bar of your Mac And you get to go and choose a monitor and you can choose different resolutions uh, or the the big one right at the top, disable and boom, it's gone. So, uh, so there you go. Uh, It does say that this software could cause uh, irretrievable damage to your computer. Uh, I see this a lot and, you know, people that just create (laughs) things for their own use on GitHub, right. You know, but uh, so you know, you'll see that too when you go here to download. Danger, but well, probably yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> it's clearly, you know, someone has figured out functionality, and so boom, just go through and do it. So very cool. It also comes with a, uh, a terminal app or a terminal. You can run it. You can invoke it from the terminal uh, if you want, which would also allow you to then script it and things like that. So very, very cool. Uh, I like it. I, I'm glad this is good stuff. So fun, fun. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And then uh, we got one more from the forums, I think, John, uh, from Jeff in the forums, if I can find it here. Yeah. Jeff said uh, he was asking about VPNs. He says, I have set up a VPN on my Synology router. Uh, he says, and it works in that I can connect back to my Synology um, and with the AF, with the IP range from the VPN. He says, now... I have chosen to allow my VPN or to set my VPN to allow access to my local computers. When you create a VPN on your local network, as Jeff has done, you can set it to only use your internet connection. So allowing you to use it to sort of tunnel safely tunnel your internet traffic when you are not at home and, and, or you can also set it to allow you to access local resources. He wants to allow, uh, allow access to local resources. So he turned on that box, which is fine. And uh, he said, in theory, that should enable me to see my Macs on my remote land. He says, I'm usually using Apple remote desktop and I don't know how to set it up so I can see all of my Macs. Should I see them under my VPN range IP or the IP of the remote network? Where would they appear? So this is an interesting thing, because when you VPN into your network, in theory, you are just another computer now on your local network. And that is true, sort of, because Bonjour, which is the thing that makes things appear like in your sidebar and all of that, generally does not translate across a VPN link. So if you launch the if you're used to connecting to other computers by launching the finder, 
and looking in the sidebar and just clicking on them and then either choosing, you know, share screen or, you know, connect. Uh, that's not going to be there. So you have to manually connect to these things. And I do it by going in the finder and going into the go connect to server menu. Uh, and then you have to type in what you want to connect to. Uh, for file sharing, I use SMB. So I type in SMB colon slash slash and then the IP address of my computer as it normally is on the local network. Um, you can, you know, do screen sharing. The way you do that is instead of typing SMB colon slash slash, you type VNC colon slash slash. And because it uses the VNC protocol for screen sharing and then boom, you can screen share and you're good to go. That that's how that works. There's no, there's no bonjour for, for that. So it's not just going to auto populate, right? Yes. No. Did I get something wrong? Yes. Oh, okay. No, absolutely. Okay. No, you're absolutely correct. So the thing is the convenience of typing in a name of the computer versus the IP address is lost typically no. when you're on a VPN. No, no. If you're, if your router supports local DNS, you can also type like I can do SMB colon slash slash okay, iMac office. What I can't do is go into the finder and just see iMac office magically appearing in the shared right. section. That's the difference. Yep. Okay. Yep. I guess let's rewind. What I'm saying is that knowing the IP address of the device that you want to connect to over VPN. Yes. Will probably help you. You may be able to use, like you said, a zero conf bonjour, whatever name, but, well, no, that's a it's a DHCP name is what that would be for local DNS, right? It, there's a difference, and, and they're often the same name, which is why it gets confusing. But when your router, when your computer can requests its IP address from your router, mm -hmm. uh, it can pass along its DHCP ID, which can be its name. And some routers, not all, but some, and his Synology router is one of the some, that does this uh, takes that name and relates it to the IP address that it hands back so that if you are on that local network or VPN in and using your router's DNS server, you can say, Hey, look, you know, if it gave my iMac office, you know, the address of uh, 192.168.1.15, I can look up iMac office and the router knows to translate that with local DNS. Okay. It's not zero conf though. That's and that's the difference. It works the same, except it also works across your VPN link. So there you go. All right. Gets a little I guess confusing. what I'm saying is yeah. my strategy to connect to my servers yeah. is to always use the IP address because I know that you know it's gonna work. Always work. Totally. Uh, I totally agreed. Yes. If you get a shortcut, like you said, a, a zero con for or bonjour or whatever you want to call it. Local, shortcut, D local DNS. Yeah. Or local DNS. The thing is, I've, as I told you, so so my primary router is my Eero now. It doesn't seem, maybe it's because you're a plus or something, but it doesn't seem to support local DNS. And I've done experiments. Oh, does, 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 and I've if done you turn off Eero it, plus, does it, does local DNS work no. again? No, so I I, I got to figure out, but but That's it weird. could be something else on my setup here. It yeah. could be my my cable modem. I, I I don't know. Huh? It shouldn't be, but it could be. I thought. Anyways, I thought Eero oh. supported local DNS. I'm, in fact, I'm I'm certain it does. Huh? That's All weird. I'm saying is that so certain computers, uh, and you probably know the reasons for this. So one computer that is one of my primary computers, the IP address ends in forty two, and uh, <laughs> you probably know why. Sure. Another has uh, the IP address ends in 203, which you also, being a Connecticut resident sure. or sci-fi fan, you know why. The thing is, I pick numbers at the end that are easy for me to remember. So I'm like, oh, yeah, well, you know, of course, that device has dot whatever. Um, that's cool. about it on that, I guess. No, it's just a, a no, it's a it, it's a. a you can't access the device. Oh, yeah. You thought you could. Yeah, totally. Totally. Yep. yep. It's like, dude, MacBook Pro, MacBook Pro dot local. I mean, the thing is that, it, you know, it comes up in the, uh, uh, you know, system preferences is like, well, you should be able to access this computer using, you know, this, this name. Right. And it's like, well, I can't. Why right. Not? Well, you can locally. Yeah. Just sometimes not. Right. It's just the, the VPN complicates things. Yes, it sometimes. does. It does. Totally. 
All right. I do want to thank a bunch of our premium subscribers. In fact, I want to thank all of you whose contributions came in across the last week. Uh, for those of you that want to know about premium, macgeekab.com slash premium. You all you already know that you get the premium at macgeekab.com email address to use, and we do prioritize that. Uh, you get that warm, fuzzy feeling from supporting your two favorite geeks. And the people that uh, that added to their warm, fuzzy feeling this week were, uh, let's see, we had a one-time contribution of 100 bucks from Lee M. Thank you so much, Lee. You rock. On our $10 monthly contribution plan. Came in uh, payments from uh, Joe BP, Tony Z, Ev the Nerd, Robert D, and Nick S. And on the biannual $25 plan, Mike H, Charles K, Robert R, Run KMC, Keith M, <laughs> Thomas S, Chuck J, Janes H, and Mark W. Thank you so much to all of you. You, uh, it, everybody who's a premium subscriber, thank you. You rock. It really, it, it does. It makes a huge difference for us. So, If you didn't do what you do, we may not do what we do. That is pretty true. I'm not making a threat. I'm, I'm, no, I'm it's, just it's facts, how it goes. You know? Yeah, it's, it's how it goes. For sure. You know, it's how the markets work. But um, It is. Run K, well, wasn't there a run DMC? Well, I, yes. I, I kind of like that handle. Of okay. course. So, of course. So that's a uh, yeah, yeah, creative yeah. variation on the... Uh, Correct. Correct. Rapper band, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Exactly. Yep. Okay, KMC. Thank you so much. And everybody. Yeah. All right. Uh, David asks a question that seems to be getting more and more common here in Mackie Gab land. He says, I'm in the market to purchase a Synology and I'm looking at the DS1817 Plus for it to become my media server and backup destination. Or do you think a different Synology disk station would be better? As far as transcoding, I chose the DS1817 Plus to accommodate future expandability. Um, and uh, for a NAS, do you think Western Digital Gold or Western Digital Red hard drives are better? All right. Uh, he says, I'm going to be waiting until Black Friday to order, which is smart. So because you never know, there's always deals and we like deals. But so that's a big question, especially in light of the fact, Dave, I was just at the Sonali event. Unfortunately, you couldn't make it. They should have one in Boston, don't you think? Uh, and they have it in New York City. Sure. But also, I was at a Photo Plus Expo, and some of the NAS vendors were there as mm. well. So it's a it's a good question in the, you know, how do you make the right choice? I mean, you don't want something that's wimpy, and that that is actually the case that I'm well, in right now. Well, he certainly doesn't. Not, I mean, for some people, you know, a, a lower powered and lower cost to station is absolutely the right thing. If all you're doing is you know, sharing files on it. Uh, maybe you wanted to run your VPN yes. server. Like these are, these are low impact things, but he wants it to be a media server and he wants it to do transcoding. So the DS 1817 right. so plus a, is super so you need powerful. A processor. So you need a processor that can handle that. And the thing is Synology has things ranging from kind of wimpy, but as you pointed out, they're appropriate for NAS stuff. Like if mm -hmm. you just want to use it as a storage device okay but if you want to do more sophisticated things like transcoding and running a vpn or, or i'm sorry virtualization which is uh, uh they're they're gonna hook me up with something that'll help me do that did you know that you can use your synology to run a vm of uh, course yeah well, if it's powerful can, enough yeah but i can't uh, with my current units dave i can't because right. the pro that they limit it sensibly is that your processor is just too wimpy i'm sorry yeah <laughs> So, so the DS eighteen seventeen, it, it, that's actually the one I have here and the one I currently run, and it will it will do transcoding for you. But here's the thing you need to know: the DS eighteen seventeen plus does not do hardware transcoding, so it is using the CPU a hundred percent of the time when you want to transcode a video, which happens most of the time. You are playing a video unless you pre transcode things and store them in that format and it's just then streaming them across the you know the link to your plex uh, app or uh, if you're using video station or whatever uh there are some disk stations though that have a hardware transcoding uh, chip in them and that makes things a lot more efficient because you've got this portion of the chip or a separate chip depending on how it's laid out that is just there to do this transcoding and for that i really like the new ds918 plus um it's got a good CPU in it. 
It has the hardware transcoder. Um, it only has four bays. That's that's the only limitation that I see on that unit. And I, I say this as someone who started running a five bay unit and now is in an eight bay unit. Uh, you, you know, it, you, it, you need to think about how you're going to lay out your drives. But for most people these days starting out, drives are big enough that really you can get away with a four bay unit and probably do just fine. And it, and then the 918 plus is also expandable. So you've, you know, you can, I, I think it's expandable. I, the, the no, model, you're right. Okay. No, I, I asked them about that. So Good. the thing is many Synology units will accept, I, I think right now it's an eSATA mm. expansion bay. So even now the one that I have now, which is quite dated, the 713 plus is a two bay. It has a two bay expansion chassis connected to it by an eSATA cable. And and as far as I know, eSATA is what they use in the internal as well. So you're not losing anything by having an expansion bay, but it's right. nice when you do buy a Synology or other NAS, um, see if they have an option for you throwing some more drives on there. Though as Dave pointed out, which is a good point, like right now, when it, at the event I went to, Seagate just announced a 14 ter yes, 14 terabyte it's awesome. Uh, Iron Wolf Drive. So having a lot of bays may not be a big deal. No. I mean, it, if you can get 14 terabytes on a single drive, I mean, it's it's crazy what they're doing, uh, at least with the rotationals. Uh, yeah. The, they'll get there eventually with the SSDs, but a 14 terabyte rotational drive? It's crazy. It's crazy. So, yeah. So I would, um, I, you know, I, I think the 918, that that's the unit. That uh, that really kind of percolates to the top very quickly for us here these days. Um, it's an it's an easy choice. It'll it'll last you into the future. So I, I think that's a good one. As far as the drives, well, you asked about red versus gold from WD. The gold drives at Western Digital are geared for long term storage uh, for data centers. The red drives are built for NAS. So. Uh, I, that to me, that answer is easy Buy the NAS drive, go red, um, cost wise, it will be tempting to go to green. Uh, we've talked a lot about this. I know you <sighs> do green drives, Mr. Braun, but well, uh, no, they're, they're in the pile of things that I'm bringing to my recycling center good. because they failed. Now they, they lasted many years, Sure, but I'm with you is that green drives are not and that's not built for NAS design yeah. for NAS. So get, get, get NAS drives. You, you don't need the iron wolf drives for a home setup, but you know, they're nice to have. They have a lot more diagnostics. They can sync up with the NAS in a kind of a, a, a whole new way, but. Well, but they talk to, Synology in that correct. you, if you get an iron wolf drive, Synology will enable additional functionality as far as monitoring yeah. uh, its performance and reporting and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. So I'm I not sure if I they would, do that with others, but, um, you know, it's worth looking at. And and they also have like an enterprise, you know, data recovery option for the Iron Wolf. It's, uh, but yeah, it's more an enterprise. Yeah. Well, I, it's I would just go for the red. I would go for red drives, either, you know, Seagate mm -hmm. or WD, just get their NAS focused drives and you'll be in good shape. So, uh, we have uh, Ed. Let's let's answer Ed's question quickly. I think I think this is a, a quick one because we're not lawyers. A so ethical. We, we can't go too deep. Well, it's a legal thing. Um, Ed asks. He says, "I have a large collection of music CDs and DVDs that I've all ripped and put onto my computer. Is there a reason to keep the originals, or can I donate them to charity or my local library? Says I have an Apple Music subscription and use Plex for watching my movies." So here's the thing, right? You would need those CDs or DVDs if something happened to your media library. So don't let something happen to your media library. Like, you know, back that up, do whatever you need to do. That that should go without saying, but we like to say it anyway. Uh, as far as what you're talking about, though, as I understand the law, and I am just hack lawyer Dave here, right? I'm actually a pretty good hack lawyer, I've been told, but, you know, still, I'm just a hack lawyer. Uh, I don't, I, I, don't, I have not passed the bar exam. I don't necessarily intend to. So, uh, but as I understand it, if you were to donate those CDs or DVDs to someone or give them to someone or sell them to someone, it doesn't matter if they, if you transfer ownership of them, 
you have also transferred ownership of your license to that content. Uh, technically, you probably don't even have a license to rip them, but I, I think there's been enough history with that that you'd probably be able to get away with it if you, if somebody said, hey, you have a digital copy of this movie and you're like, right, I ripped it from this DVD. I think you're covered there. But if you can't produce the DVD from which you ripped it, you now have an illegal copy of that movie. So is someone going to come after you for this? Well, I can't. I, there's no crystal balls, but I don't think so. That said, if it matters to you to be able to have these licenses, don't give away the licenses. And the CDs and DVDs are those licenses. That's that's as hack lawyer Dave understands it. So there you go. I, you know, d do whatever you want. Uh, I, I I think I'm pretty much with you. So I've worked with patent attorneys and copyright attorneys and, sure. and all sorts of attorneys. And the thing is, you're absolutely correct in your interpretation. The thing is, you have a license to the content. You do not own the content. No, you no. Have a temporary license uh, tied to that media. And like you said, um, if you liberate that media from its original medium onto another thing that's where the license lives so if you then give it to someone else yes you are technically being naughty you should now. delete we'll, you should delete the movies and songs when you give away or otherwise transfer ownership of the cds or dvds correct yes correct if yes. you do retain them and then you do also give them then you are technically breaking the law on the other hand in the spirit of sharing content and making people happy and the thing is i've actually bought Depends on who you're – this is subjective now because I'm pretty sure the person yeah. who wrote the song or created the movie would not yes. be happy by the scenario you're about to describe. So, you know, bear that in mind. Yeah. No, I, I, I get that. But the thing is I've actually bought – and I'm sure uh, I've actually bought at my library. And actually my library right now does not accept any CD or DVD donations anymore. Right. Right. But I've been able to buy some old DVDs that they had in their library for like a dollar or two dollars. Sure. There was times that certainly sold for more than that. But the thing is, so do you want to help benefit people in your community and expose them to new art and, and entertainment? Um, and can you live with yourself if you're kind of breaking the law? I, I guess is it, it's a gray area, I, I, I guess is the thing. So, yeah, I mean, the other thing, too, is the impact on the environment. I mean, what if you throw them away? I mean, you know, there's what aluminum and plastic and oh, stuff yeah. like that. I mean, just throwing them in the trash maybe is not the best thing. So if you do want to discard them and be legally clean, maybe properly recycle them. I don't know. Well, or, or yeah, or give them. I mean, the best way to recycle is to give them to someone that's actually going to use them. So there you go. Well, hence the library. Yeah, argument, right? exactly. Right. Yeah, for sure. All right. Mark asked, he said, um, guys, what's your opinion on the Comcast X5 pods as an alternative to other different mesh slash extender solutions? So uh, Comcast slash Xfinity is offering these what they call the X5 pods. If you have the Comcast X5 router, you can add these pods, which just plug in all over your house and or create a wireless mesh. These pods are the first generation plume pods. Okay. It, they, they are hardware wise. They are that software wise. They are mostly that, but they will only work with your Comcast router and you can't take them and, and use them on a normal plume network. Right. But, but from a hardware standpoint, that's what they are. These are that's again, stupid. what's that? That's stupid. No, no, no. It's very well, smart, actually, it, because well, it makes it super easy. Integration uh, standpoint. Okay. I think from an integration standpoint, you just plug them in and they work. Right. And that's Comcast's goal. Comcast is actually doing some very cool stuff with with this and, and their mesh stuff. And it's I, I actually like it because it totally takes the headache away. You just get the stuff, you plug it in and it's, it's good to go. Right. Uh, but it is just the first generation pods. And anecdotally what I've heard, I have not tested these, but uh, I've got a lot of friends and family who have. And then of course, all of you that we hear from either with the X5 setup or with the plume first gen setup is that these don't really reach as far as you might want them to based on what I can tell. I don't think they're going to 
I don't think they're even going to match the performance of, of say a first gen Eero system or something. So be aware of what you're getting into with these, that they're, they're probably not going to do stellar work for you. That said, please don't take this as a dismissal of plume in its entirety because the plume super pods are freaking amazing. Like these things are really good. They've got three radios, one of which is a four by four radio and they, they go far, they go fast. They're very reliable. So buying from plume and getting the, the super pods. Great. The, the non super pods again, I haven't tested them. So it, I, I can only share what I've heard anecdotally. And what I have heard is meh, like it does better. It, it helps, but it's not great. That's sort of the, the general consensus I get from everyone that has tried them. Hmm. So, and it could be that, you know, it just so happens that everybody I talk to is placing them incorrectly or whatever, but it is universally the answer that I get is meh, you know, so bear that in mind. Uh, but it's super easy, right? As I said, setting it up. So maybe they'll f figure out a way to, to do an X5 super pod, right? And if they do that, then mm. that could change everything. So, so there you go. So just, so keep it, uh, keep it real. So I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. 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 Sorry about that. Uh, yeah. Well, there you go. Where, where so, are we at? That you know where we're at, man, is we are I think we're pretty much at the end of this uh this particular run, my friend. It's just kinda how it goes. It's good. It's it good. It just seemed like moments ago we started talking. Uh yeah. And solving problems and uh, uh creating a nice little uh uh I don't like potpourri really. Uh even the crouton thing, you know. I like croutons on my salad. Uh, we didn't we didn't call this well, a actually, salad today, you know, but I'm gonna be with you. No, uh, actually, I'm I'm with you. No, I actually, oh, I got a really good one. They just had a new one at the at the store I went to. It was like a a miso spinach salad. I think it was dull or something, but no, it was good. It was it had like miso and uh, crunchy noodles and spinach, and it's probably good for me. Too. Uh, probably but it was crunchy too because you know a part of food, Dave. It's not just the taste, but the texture and the smell. Yeah, the, there's so many aspects of it. Kind of like a podcast. I mean, we don't just solve See problems. See what I'm saying? See what I'm you saying? Know, we, we do all sorts of things here. You know, if we just had a single goal, it'd get boring and old. And I don't know. The, the single goal is to help solve years. your problems, right? Like, that's it. Well, yeah. pull stuff out. But um, Yes, that's true. If we just did one thing, we'd be bored to death having to do that thing for over a decade that's but we're true not because it's me it's dave it's you it's the variety in the show it's a, I, I, I don't know where to go with this I'm, uh I'm i'll i'll take advocating. it from here because we yeah. actually need to get out so come visit oh. our forums at macgeekab.com slash forums and uh and you can interact with all the great stuff you heard some some samples of What's going on there? Not only questions that have been asked, but answers that have come in and really, really great stuff. You know how to contact us. You know how to email us. So come visit the forums and and that's uh, that's where we're going to go with that. I want to send a big shout out of thanks to the folks at Cashfly, C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. I want to send a big shout out of thanks to all of our sponsors, including OWC, of course, at MaxSales.com. Smile at SmileSoftware.com slash podcasts barebones software at barebones.com ring.com slash mgg linkedin.com slash jobs and a ton of new ones coming in uh next month so there you go thank you so much for listening thank you for contributing in all the ways that you do i believe we're gonna see if we can get mr braun to be pithy and concise here for this last little moment, it might take some effort. But Mr. Braun, do you have something lasting to share with our friends here? I do. And it's not going to be three or two. I, I may even get it down to one word. No, I, I can't do that. It's impossible. But the three words that I have for you are don't get caught. Made up.